make sure subscribe my channel for daily updates. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a man giving some information about transport in London. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, can I help you? Oh yes, I was wondering what the best way was for me to get around London. Well, there are a lot of possibilities. As you probably realise, the main ways to get around are bus, train and tube. Oh? The underground. Oh. It depends how much you want to spend. Mm. All forms of transport offer special tickets, such as cheap day returns on the trains and so on. Overall, you'll spend less on the bus as it operates on a basic flat fare for each journey. Mm-hmm. But, of course, it may not go to where you need to travel to. Oh. The mainline trains only operate in the outlying areas, though a few cross London, whereas the Tube has stations which are placed in central areas of the city, close to the main sites and shops. Mm. Obviously, there are more bus stops, uh, but you will probably have to change buses to get where you want, which can be inconvenient. Oh. You will find that the buses are mainly in the central areas, but some tube lines go quite a long way out of London, so you could use this for longer journeys. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the tubes do get very crowded, so you should use the train if you want to sit down. <sighs> it does depend where you're travelling to. Well, I'm living on the outskirts, but I have to travel into London to college every day, and then around London when I'm here. Hmm. OK, so time is going to be an issue for you. Mm. The Tube should be fast crossing London, but quite honestly, there are so many delays that it's not very efficient. Again, the train has fewer stops, so is probably your quickest option to get to and from college. Huh. Of course, which service you use might depend on how frequent it is. I mean, the trains might only be every 20 minutes or whatever, but a timetable is published to save you hanging around. Oh. There are a lot of tube trains at busy times of day, but fewer at other times, whereas the buses run every five minutes through most of the day, and there are night buses. But you'll need to check out your route first. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. OK, thanks. How can I get from here to Hackney, then? Right, well, you can choose. Uh, we're here at the Information Office, OK? Uh, now, next to us, on the corner of the High Street and Sweet Street, is the bus stop, opposite the bank. Uh-huh. The bus goes all the way to Hackney, but it is a very indirect route, so it could take ages. Oh. If you want to take the train, walk down the high street towards the city, go past the bank, and on your left is the station, mm -hmm. just before you get to the post office. Mm. There's a mainline service to Hackney Wick, so if you need to get into the centre of Hackney, you may need to pick up a bus when you get there. Mm. 
Opposite the post office, on the corner of Hart Lane, is the tube entrance. You'll see the big signs. That's probably the best way to get there, though you may have to change. It's probably best if you go and get a travel card first. Oh. To get to the ticket office, you go out of here onto the High Street. Then turn into South Street, and the ticket office is on your right opposite the cinema. Mm. Of course, you may decide it's quicker to take a taxi. <laughs> but it's a long way, so I think it'll be very expensive. If you do want to get a cab, then the rank is outside here, just opposite the office. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. This morning we are going to look at the issue of cloning. I'd like to begin by looking at some examples of animals that have been cloned before moving on to looking at how cloning is defined. First, look at questions 11 to 13. As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions 11 to 13. Good morning and welcome to this series of lectures on man interfering with nature. This morning we are going to look at the issue of cloning. I'd like to begin by looking at some examples of animals that have been cloned before moving on to looking at how cloning is defined. The first example I'd like to talk about is Idaho Gem who is the very first mule to be cloned. Mules are a combination of horse and donkey. Idaho Jem is an identical copy of his brother Taz, who is a racing champion. Thus, we can make the conclusion here that he was cloned to follow in his brother's footsteps. The next example I'd like to refer to is Cece, which stands for copycat. Like her name suggests, she was the first cloned kitten, Interestingly, Cece was created in a laboratory in the state of Texas by the very same scientists who made Dolly the Sheep in Scotland. Cece is physically identical to her mother, Rainbow, and what is important about this is that it has opened the doors for people to clone their pets in the future. Now, the last animal example I'd like to look at today is the pig. In 2001, Five piglets were born, all female. They were created by a firm who claimed that their birth is an important step for medicine. The idea is that pig organs and cells could be used in human transplants because the pigs have been cloned without a certain cell. This cell is a vital link because it is the one in human beings that is responsible for making the body reject donor organs. This means that not only is the transplant operation unsuccessful, but the patient's life could be at risk. Now, I'd like to discuss some of the current definitions of cloning. Now look at questions 14 to 20. One kind of cloning, the kind commonly found in plants, 
occurs when plants reproduce themselves around the original plants, known as the parent plants. New plants can then grow. This is quite a natural process by which plants can form more of the same type of plant. Though you may not be aware of it, another type of cloning happens quite naturally in your body when old cells need to be replaced. Cells in your body split into two and make new chromosomes, and it is the chromosomes that contain our genes. Embryo splitting is another form of cloning. Which can happen quite naturally when cells split to form two identical twins. You may then be asking yourself what all the fuss is about. If cloning does in fact happen naturally, because sometimes man can interfere with nature and it can work. Take embryo splitting as an example. Now this type of cloning is quite common in farming, and it is used to breed new bulls and cows. Embryos are placed into foster mother cows, and these then grow into calves. And though some may consider this to be artificial, it has been going on for the last ten years with relatively few problems. Now, the last type of cloning I'd like to mention is perhaps the most controversial. This type of cloning is called nuclear transfer. And it is when the nucleus of a cell is put into an egg of another animal that is genetically the same. This is done in a laboratory, and after about five or six days, the embryo is implanted into a donor mother, which is how Dolly the sheep was made. One argument in favor of cloning is that it can help in medicine, as in the case of pigs being used in transplant operations. It is true that many people can wait for up to a year for a new kidney, and then still run the risk of their bodies rejecting the donor kidney. But will using pig organs really be the solution? To answer this question, I'd like to take a look at some responses to the whole idea of using pig organs in humans. Neil Blackwood, who works for the company that cloned the five piglets. Described it as a major medical advance that could solve the global problem of a lack of organs to use in transplant operations. This could lead in the future to saving human lives. Sheila Halliday, a leading transplant surgeon, does not share his view. She believes that although it is possible to use pig organs in humans, there are very real dangers. Halliday points out that diseases and infections could be passed from pig to human. Of course, she does not yet know this for certain, which is why Halliday strongly advocates that more scientific research be done. She firmly believes pig organs should not be used in human operations until these findings are made public. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a conversation between two friends who are discussing the organization of a party. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Hi, Matt. Right on time. Have you been waiting long?、Mm, five minutes. The buses were held up on the high street. Otherwise, I would have been early. Yeah, there's something wrong with them today. Yes, I think so. Okay, what should we do? Should we go and have a coffee? Yeah, that would be nice. 
There's that place on the corner over there. It does really nice coffee and cakes and things, and at this time it's usually very quiet, so we'll be able to talk. OK, let's go there then. So, when's the party going to be? Well, it has to be at the end of September, before we all leave for university. We've plenty of time then. We don't go for another five weeks, do we? Hmm. Well, we haven't really got that much time, if you think about it. There are only a couple of weeks at the beginning of September when all of us are around. Oh, yes, I forgot. Nazrin, Phil and Nicky and all that lot have gone off on holiday. And I'm away for two weeks from tomorrow. So, what does that leave us, then? As far as I know, we're all here between the 19th and the 30th of September. Will Sandra be around, then? I know that she has a whole string of family birthdays at that time, and she might not be available. Hmm. Well, let's make a note of that, and we can contact her about it. OK. Shall we settle for the 21st of September, then? What day is the 21st? It's a Saturday. Is that OK? That's fine. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And now for the tricky bit. Where are we going to hold it? Well, I spoke to Nikki last week and she volunteered her place as they have a huge house and garden. Oh, fantastic. Will her parents be around? Yeah, I think so, but she said they won't mind. Oh, right. Well, my parents wouldn't like it at all. <laughs> Nor mine. <laughs> but is it definite? Yes. When I spoke to her, she said it was definitely on. I'll just have to confirm the dates with her. We thought it would be one weekend in September, so I'll just have to make sure that that one is OK. One thing Nikki suggested, we could have a daytime party, as we could be outside if the weather is fine. Oh, wow. How far out does she live? It's not that far. Do you know where West Road crosses the bridge? Yeah. It's the first house on the right, with that huge drive up to the front door. Oh, right. I know exactly where it is. The road is off the A33 and runs north, then over the bridge and first on the right. I know it. Ah, oh, the place is amazing. You know it has a big swimming pool. Does everyone know where she lives? Most of her friends do, but not all. But it doesn't matter, as we can put this map Nicky sent me in with the invitation. How shall we do the invitation? We can do it on the computer. I can scan the map and we'll put it all onto an A4 page. Is this the address? Can I just write the address down? It's 93 West Road and I'll take the phone number. It's 477130. Right. There's one other thing. Yes? We're all giving £10 towards refreshments and food. There'll probably be a barbecue. Do you think that's enough? Oh, right. Yeah, that's fine. And everyone will have to help tidy up afterwards, including the boys. <laughs> that is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about a website. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. I'm Jenny Ironbridge and today I'm going to be continuing my series of talks on information technology by looking at an innovative information source available on the internet. I'm sure you're all familiar with the strengths and weaknesses of the popular search engines like Google or Yahoo. Sometimes you can find what you're looking for instantly. At other times, searching for something which may or may not exist can be a frustrating and time-consuming experience. So, where can you go to get the information you want? The information source I want to talk about is called Wikipedia. As its name suggests, it's a form of encyclopedia. It's already the largest information source in history both in terms of its breadth and its depth. But what makes Wikipedia really unique is that it's a democratic project. The content is completely free to access and it's written entirely by unpaid volunteers. Changes and additions are being made all the time to articles which exist already, but it's also possible to contribute whole new articles. And basically, anyone can contribute once they've grasped the basics of editing the pages. Let's look at how someone goes about editing Wikipedia articles. It's a very straightforward procedure, which has been made deliberately easy so that people who have contributions to make are not discouraged from participating because of their limited understanding of information technology. Let's start by imagining that we are reading an article and we come across information that we consider to be incorrect or incomplete on a page of Wikipedia. First of all, we decide we'd like to change it. To do this, we click on the Edit button at the top of the page. This takes us to another page with a text box containing all the editable text on that page. It's at this point that we can input our changes in exactly the same way as we would if we were writing or editing a document we had created on our own computer. In other words, we can type, cut and paste, delete, and use all the normal word processing functions. When this has been done, and we've finished editing, we are then asked to summarise the changes we've made. This doesn't go into the main text box, but into a separate area below it. That's the main part of the process over with, but we need to make sure that the changes we've made are going to appear as we want them. A last check, if you like. In order to do this, we select the Preview option. If we're still not satisfied, we have the option of returning to the Edit stage and working through the same procedure again. Finally, if we're satisfied with the result, we simply click on Save and our changes will take immediate effect. A question that might already be forming in your mind if you are not familiar with Wikipedia is this. How can I tell whether information is accurate? This particular point has led to criticism from some people, especially academics and professionals. The short answer is that you can't tell. But if you think about it, how can you check the accuracy of information you read in a conventional encyclopedia, or in a newspaper, or on other internet websites? Besides, it's possible for contributors to Wikipedia to register with the organisation and, as named contributors, gradually build up a reputation for themselves as reliable sources of information. The other point to be aware of is that there are administrators who monitor contributions that are added by anonymous sources and check for biased, out-of-date or incorrect information. 
One of the problems that arises from the openness of Wikipedia is that vandals have got into the site to change and damage pages of information. So the administrators have a role in policing this too. Lastly, Wikipedia encourages editors to stick to certain rules which help ensure the quality of entries. For example, contributors are expected to maintain a neutral tone in their writing, although perhaps it's impossible to be completely neutral. Also, entries are not allowed to include original research, which is intended to prevent contributors from simply submitting their own views. It's unlikely that the more conventional information sources will ever be completely replaced by Wikipedia or similar projects which may be developed in the future. But this is an ambitious experiment to democratise information, using modern technology to enable anyone and everyone to contribute to and access a common body of knowledge. And because it's free, it doesn't restrict access to those with the ability to pay. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.